I was really excited about the potential that the Susquehanna Conference held, holds. Okay, because we were coming into our second year, and you hear about the terrible twos with, with young ones, as if you have children or grandchildren, and my granddaughter is gonna be two in another 11 months. So I'm expecting that my son and daughter-in-law are gonna be going through a whole lot of problems. As you remember, your sons and daughters when they were two. But this year has not so much been a problem, it's been an exciting time. It's been a terrific two. My time has, has been one of a lot of prayer for all of you, for the clergy, and for this conference, and, and for the transformation of disciples, which is what our mission really is. I wasn't specifically seeking this position. I wanted to help the conference out. I volunteered on, in the visioning leadership team. But God sought me. He called me to this particular position through Bishop Middleton and others of the nominating committee. I didn't receive any special mentoring or training, and I jumped in feet first. And now standing here before you, it's, it is, it's exciting, but it is a little scary. Thank you for that laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Jarrett knows. <laughs> yes, I said, here I am, Lord, just like Samuel did. And so I began to pray. I prayed in terms of, God, I'm, I'm in this position. Where do I go from here? What do I do? And what keep, kept coming back to me is the conference vision statement. And as I read and reread the Susquehanna Conference vision statement, I grew both excited and a little scared. It's up there on the screen now, as you can see. People alive in mission and ministry as God leads us on a Christ-centered journey of faith. Now, that whole part about people alive in mission and ministry, that's the exciting part. Can you imagine, you know, there's, there's several hundred people here this morning, and I'm sure more are going to be coming in as the day rolls on, and then we'll have the clergy join us later on as we begin with the opening uh, worship session. But... What scared me was I began to think, well, I've got a lot of responsibility. I have to, I may be doing this all alone. But not really, because there's all of you. And more importantly, there's God. God brought me to this position. God brings all of us to this, these positions that we hold. And with your help and with God's help, we will be a people alive. Today's Lady Session, we have quite an agenda before us, and there should be a slide coming up shortly on that. We're going to start off with a short devotion. We're going to delve into lay servant ministries. Now, I know a lot of you have had questions about lay servant ministries and what that means, and, and as a certi maybe a certified lay minister, where's this training that I'm supposed to have? How am I going to be recertified? Well, we're going to touch a little bit about that, we don't have all the answers. We are developing the answers, but we have somebody who will speak to that. We're going to be talking about growing effective churches and what that means to be a people alive in Christ. We're going to be talking about God's call and pastoral ministry and how that particular way is a way to be alive in Christ and journey in faith. We're going to talk about our on-site mission project that we have, <coughs> Stop Hunger Now. That is only 75 steps from that doorway. I counted them last night. And we're going to talk about building our community here amongst all of you. And we're going to talk about building on our vitality. So we have a lot to cover over these next hour and a half to two hours. But it doesn't mean that we need to rush. Okay, in fact, if, if we get done a little early and hopefully Stop Hunger Now will be set up, you'll be able to go over there and begin to help the least and last and lost of our world. So as we begin our journey at this laity session, let's open with a devotion and a time of centering. Please stand if you are able as we open in praise and adoration to God Almighty. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Wenzel. I'm the director of uh, music here at our annual conference. The songs we're going to sing, at least the first one, I Lead and You're My Echo. So let's praise God.
serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart. With all my heart. With all my soul. With all my I will serve. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. This one will be easy because you'll echo me. Isn't God good? Amen. Please be seated. If you remember the conference vision statement I read a couple of minutes ago, which is people alive in ministry and mission, 
as God leads us on a Christ-centered journey of faith. That plays into the, the lesson that I'd like to talk about today. That vision was lived out over two millennia ago by the first disciples. And let's discover how they were alive in Christ together. And we should have Acts 2. Thank you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all those, all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's focus first on that last part of verse 47. And the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. How similar is that to making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? That's our mission statement. And since that's our mission, maybe the earlier verses can tell us about how they accomplished that over 2,000 years ago. If you read verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. How is that different from calling and equipping? Concepts that we're going to be hearing about later when we talk about lay servant ministries. And if you notice, it wasn't just the apostles or 2,000 years later, the clergy doing this. It was everyone. Everyone met every day, broke bread in their homes, and had everything in common. When I discussed this devotion with someone before annual conference, they suggested that the next several days here at Messiah will be a little like that Acts 2 experience. Now, I'm not suggesting that we sell all our possessions and go live in a commune. But I think one of the things Luke had in mind when he wrote verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, was that they were of one mind, one purpose, one mission. That same mission that we have today, which I think is on a slide. Not just the mission of the clergy, but of the church. The mission for all of us, for everyone. Where everyone is alive in ministry and mission, together. And everyone is in an active or vital community or church, together. Just like it was a partnership of apostles and new believers, today it's a partnership of clergy and laity, alive in Christ and on a journey of faith. Let's have a brief moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, creator of all, ruler of all, we acknowledge and confess that we are not a perfect people, and yet you continue to love us all. You sent your only son among us to lead us, to teach us, and more importantly, to save us. We are so thankful for that salvation, that grace you give so freely. Lord, we humbly ask for your guidance and wisdom over these next several days of reports and recommendations and action items. Help us to see beyond the written and spoken words, and the phrases, the complex sentences. Instead, as we read or hear these items, help us to see the lives that have, have been and will be transformed by your son's modern day disciples. Lord, as we go through these next days, help us to discern how we may take what we learn here at annual conference and use it to energize our home churches, maintaining and strengthening that which is vital, envisioning those new directions you wish us to go. We ask you further strengthen each of our partnerships 
that we have with our pastors, working either through us or in spite of us, that we can truly be alive in Christ on a journey of faith. And all God's people said, Amen. Our closing song will be, They'll Know We Are Christians. Please stand if you are able. Friends, I want us to have fun in worship, and I want the Spirit to lead you whenever you're open to it. So at any time, if you feel like clapping or moving or singing a desk camp part or singing parts, hugging your neighbor, shaking hands, <laughs> I saw those eyes get really big. I want you to do that. Let's be open to the Spirit. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Please be seated. I'd like to introduce to you Matt Wenzel, <laughs> who's walking away from his mic. <laughs> the Sessions Committee had a bunch of meetings this spring, and the one thing they failed to tell me is that that camera adds about 60 pounds. 
eating light in the dining hall, all that Coke I had for breakfast. I'm Matt Wenzel. I'm the musical director here at Annual Conference. Uh, by day, I'm an elementary general music teacher in the Conewago Valley School District, New Oxford, Pennsylvania. And then I uh, serve as the director of music ministries at Zion United Methodist in York. And I am honored and excited to be here as the musical director, and I love to have fun. Worship should be a joyful experience because God is good, and he's so worthy of our praise. So my goal this year at annual conference was to include as many musicians from around the conference as I possibly could. Um, for a lot of the sessions and the plenary sessions, I'll sort of be by myself at the piano, but at our opening celebration this afternoon, I'll be joined by Chris McKee, who's a very dear friend from Zion, is a trumpet player, and will also be blessed by uh, the handbell ensemble from the First United Methodist Church of Hershey, and I'll move myself over to the organ at that time, too. Uh, this evening, hopefully you've seen in the link and other places about the mass choir, the annual conference choir. On paper, I have about 100 singers, so in our memorial service tonight, we'll really be blessed by their ministry. Um, Carol Hagee, who is my accompanist at Zion, is a terrific pianist. And uh, we'll be doing some piano and organ duets, too, as the gathering music. Tomorrow evening at the celebration of ministry, I have instrumentalists coming to form a praise band with horn line. Anybody like the band Chicago? Anybody out there? That's how we'll worship tomorrow. That's going to be a lot of fun. And then I have a jazz combo coming with me Saturday morning. I'm going to do jazz and gospel. And then I'm really going to sit on some pieces on the organ for the ordination service. So lots of music, uh, lots of different musicians from all sorts of places in the conference. And I'm just really blessed to be here with you. So if you would like to talk to me, I love to shake hands. It's quite possible that at breakfast or lunch or dinner, I will come and sit with you at random because I want to meet as many of you as I possibly can. But um, it's going to be a great week. We'll praise and worship God together. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Matt. So you see, we have a lot of exciting worship planned here over the next several days. And it's, uh, that's one of the most awesome things that I think that I remember about the, even the very first conference that I attended many years ago was that this conference knows how to worship. And I'm sure the former Wyoming conference knew how to worship as well. And so we're carrying on that tradition as a Susquehanna conference in terms of our worship and our praise of God. As I said earlier, we have several uh, folks who are gonna be talking uh, this morning about some things that are pressing upon many of the laity, some of the things that, uh, that you need to hear about and learn about and take back to your churches. The first is gonna be uh, Kathy um, uh, Heaps. Catherine Heaps is the coordinator of Lay Speaking, Lay Servant Ministries for the York District and the Susquehanna Conference. And Kathy will be joining us up here to talk a little bit about Lay Servant Ministries. Kathy, if you wanna come on up. Good morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. Um, we talk about God working in our lives. I'm just coming from Bible school at our church. We have a little church in the very far southeast corner of York County, and we are having Bible school this, this um, week. And as we were singing our first praise hymn, I was smiling because the words are those of Mark 12, 30, 31, and they're our memory verse for Bible school this week. So God is working in intricate ways among all our lives. During the time that I have been uh, Lay Servant Ministries Director with York, we've seen many changes in the world, in the church, and in the program. One thing that has not changed, however, is the program's goal to train Christ-centered leaders. The program is designed to help those who God has called to use his or her spiritual gifts to care for others, lead others toward Jesus Christ, and to communicate to others the good news of salvation. The 2012 Book of Discipline, paragraph 266, 631.6, and 668 
states that lay servants should be professing members of a local church or charge who is ready and desirous to serve the church and who is well informed on and committed to the scriptures and the doctrine, heritage, organization, and the life of the United Methodist Church, and who has received specific training to develop skills in witnessing to the Christian faith through spoken communication, church and community leadership, and caregiving ministries. An applicant must be active in the support of the local church or charge. Now, John Wesley used the ministry of the laity as the backbone of his Christian societies. Today, we need to remember our heritage and restore the ministry of the laity. Lay Servant Ministries provides a fellowship and network to cultivate a broader understanding of what it means to serve Christ within and beyond the church. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may be proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now most of you have heard the call to leadership within your church, within your conference, because you're here to represent your congregation, your organi organization, or your charge. First, we were chosen by God called, if you will. By accepting the call, we became God's ministers. We are also given the job of leadership. Lay servant ministries can provide you with training and insights to better equip you to be effective leaders. Then, we'll send you out with a new enthusiasm so that you can recognize potential leadership in your fellow laity. If the United Methodist Church is to become alive in Christ together on a journey of faith, then we must do all that we can to live our faith in the view of all we encounter. Much has been written and said about transforming the church to meet the needs of the 21st century. We need to become effective and involved in meeting the needs of our communities. I have a matrix that's going to be on five slides. This matrix lists the areas in which lay servant ministries can train laity to meet those needs. Evangelism and hospitality courses equip laity to encourage their congregations to be more outward focused, welcoming and inviting. Congregations where lay servants lead worship services with passion and insight are more likely to encounter Christ. Laity that are trained in the spiritual disciplines and to teach and lead small groups are instrumental in changing lives for Jesus Christ. They are made aware of opportunities within the church and in the community where more hands, feet, and hearts are needed. We equip them with skills to use in caring for those in need. For isn't that what the Christian life is all about? Lay Servant Ministries is dedicated to equipping leaders to carry out the mission of the church. And what is that mission of the church? Making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. There is much work to be done. The laity are present in the local church. They know their congregations. They know their communities. They can identify with their needs and desires. Lay servants are to work within their local congregations first. 
They are to work at home. They are to help their pastors and their other leaders to complete the mission we recognize as our calling. The United Methodist Church has recognized that we need more effective leaders to help make disciples and transforming congregations. A call to action has been approved and initiated. And you can see on the excuse me, you can see on the slide that there has to be an emphasis on our call to action. Action means doing. We have to do. We can't just sit back. Lay servants are willing to answer that call to action. They are trained to teach, encourage, and nurture laity in ways to think about their churches, communities, and world. They are to take the initiative in providing leadership, assistance, and support to their local churches and to strengthen the ministry of their pastor. They can do this by leading small groups, in Sunday school, Bible study, prayer, participating in choral groups or leading choral groups, community service, care ministries, and in any other ways adapted to meet the needs of the people to whom they minister. John Wesley said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but God and I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Wesley knew that the church needs to be outward bound. The early Methodist church was alive in Christ. They were about developing disciplined, principled leaders creating new congregations that related to the people they were reaching out to. They were dedicated to meeting the needs of the poor and helping the sick and defenseless. John Wesley taught that salvation does not end with our being forgiven. The saving work of Jesus Christ is for us to live his story by making his teachings, his life, and commandments part of our daily lives. The United Methodist Church needs to be alive in Christ. But how do we recognize those potential leaders who will, do, who help, will help do all the work that needs to be done? How do we recognize them? One of the first things that congregations can do is teach a spiritual gifts class and invite the entire congregation to participate. Encourage those people to use their gifts. Lift them up, nurture them, and mentor those new leaders. Tap into the lay servant network by asking them to come and teach classes or lead small study groups and ask them to mentor your new leaders. You need to look to the needs of the community and train your laity to meet those needs. Involve your laity in worship planning and outreach initiatives. Some of the basic leadership tools that the Lay Servant Program teaches are listed on this slide. As we strive to become more effective congregations, we need to discover what we're doing presently that is working well. Look at what's working well in your churches. What programs or efforts have been successful and fruitful? Discern how to expand this endeavor or what the best future for the mission or ministry would be. Then develop action plans. After you've developed those plans, enact them and monitor the process to ensure that it is in line with God's mission. 
Remember to use your leaders and the gifts they provide to the process. All roles are important and vital to God's mission. Clergy and laity alike are equal and important. We are given gifts so that we can, they can be shared and used. Don't shortchange God by not util utilizing what he has provided. Training is available for potential servant leaders. The Lay Servant Ministries program includes, but is not limited to the courses on this slide. Your districts have these courses available through GBOD. There are also courses offered specifically to the areas on the next slide and areas of interest. Other training opportunities are available as well. It is important to hone your leadership skills. Techniques and tools are shared during sessions that you will find effective. As many of you know, our program was previously known as Lay Speaking Ministries. During the 2012 General Conference, it was decided to change the name to Lay Servant Ministries. The change was made to take the emphasis from speaking to servant leadership. For not everyone has the gift of speaking from the pulpit, but have been given other gifts. The Book of Discipline gives guidelines for the updated, updated program, but was, it's been wisely allowed for each conference to share its program. So even though those guidelines are there, each conference has been allowed to decide what course of action they will take. Susquehanna Conference has developed a comprehensive leadership course entitled Equipping God's People. The plan is for these sessions to fulfill the training requirements for ch church leaders and for lay servants and speakers. Following the trial that is now being conducted, it will be offered to all those who wish to take leadership training. Look for more information in the future. In addition, Susquehanna Conference has decided that the status of all lay speakers, both local and certified, will remain the same for present. Certifications and training taken will be grandfathered. Opportunities to serve will be offered as it has in the past. And finally, if we are to be alive in Christ together, we must live our faith daily by our service and the acts of mercy. Go feed the hungry. Go clothe the naked. Go visit those prisoners. Heal the sick. Reach out to children and minister to the poor. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, John. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> and, and if anybody has any questions at the end of this session, um, we can possibly gather down here. Kathy, I'm sure, will be available for a few moments uh, before heading out for lunch uh, at 1130. I'm not sure if you have first lunch or not, but second, she has second lunch, so there'll be time for some questions afterwards, too. And same with other speakers for today. Uh, before we get into our next speaker, which is going to follow up a little bit on equipping God's people, as well as uh, the um, um, Growing Effective Churches initiative that the conference adopted uh, a year ago. I'd just like to recognize, I'd just like you to know, you probably didn't know this, 
but I want you to know that we are all guinea pigs here in this session. A lot of the glitches th that are happening with slides and words with songs and things of that nature, we are working out those bugs as we progress. So we're the first session in this, in this hall, so every year we are the guinea pigs in terms of working out those things. So I would hope that, that you would be patient with those things, but in the meantime, if we could just offer a round of applause to our techies who are around the building here helping us. Next on the agenda is uh, Charlie Goodeman. Charlie is, is the chair and, and lay member for the congregational development team. And Charlie has a, a, a brief thing that he'd like to talk about in terms of growing effective churches as well as equipping God's people. And he has a, uh, a, vid a short video to show us as well. Charlie? I actually feel much more comfortable with those guys than up here. But uh, one of the key things is uh, uh, we all know uh, that, that our churches uh, want to grow. We know, that, uh, uh, we know that sometimes we can't see things because they've been that way in our churches for, for a long time. So the question is, what is conference doing to help our churches grow? And last year, one of the things that uh, came up was uh, creating uh, an official uh, office for the sake of uh, helping churches. Uh, Matthew 28 is the thing that has, has been the, the most popular and the most known so far. Uh, actually, it was officially called uh, the Office of Congregational Development. And uh, the, the uh, administrative assistant said, you know, they're going to start abbreviating that. So we may want to change our name because otherwise it would be OCD. Anyway, they came up with a really nice name, uh, Growing Effective Churches. Uh, if you've seen the logo, uh, it, it uh, has a tree and, and nice colors and everything. But that's just the beginning of it. Uh, the, the key is, is uh, knowing what it is that makes a church work. Uh, we all kind of have an idea, but the closer we are to the problem, the less we generally can see it. I mean. Generally, churches' problems is they've lost sight of their mission. The whole purpose is to grow disciples for Jesus Christ. That's it. And sometimes the problem is a lack of leadership on both the pastoral side and on the lay side. Who's going to get up there and, with passion, bring other people into it? And then also an inward attitude of everybody in the church, that what happens inside the church is more important than what happens outside the church. And what will it take to get people to come to our service? That isn't what we're after. We're out there, and Jesus didn't say, I'm holding services at this time. He traipsed all over the place and used whatever to stand on or sit in or get in a boat in order to be able to talk to people. Growing Effective Church's mission is to direct the efforts to create churches that are effective in making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's the purpose behind it. We're best known probably for Matthew 28, and people say, well, what's Matthew 28? Well, if you dig inside there is the Great Commission. And um, I had the opportunity to go to several churches recently uh, that uh, have been through Matthew 28 or just starting Matthew 28 or did it years ago and uh, recorded some comments from them and here's what they said. Matthew 28 is being obedient to what God has called us to do, what the church is supposed to be about and often within the church we become sort of uh, complacent and we forget we forget what our purpose is, what we are to be doing. I was a little skeptical when it first was talked about. And at first I thought, oh, there's going to be a big change, which we aren't too good at making changes. 
But as it went on, why it's proven itself. Matthew 28 opened possibilities where it was a matter of uh, finding the right people for the right jobs and ministries and then giving them the responsibility and the authority to, to go with it. And that's really been a freeing concept for us. We didn't, we didn't know we could do things that way. And so now our emphasis is much more on our staff, both paid and unpaid, and the people, just the average person in the pew that, that if they have a passion or we see gifts and skills in them, then they're allowed to run with something as long as you know it doesn't violate major principles of the church. And one of the things that's been happening here with us is a, a focus on, on getting lay people involved as staff and them leading other lay people um, to be involved in ministry and doing ministry. It's going to do far beyond what I'm able to do as pastor. Uh, there are certain areas where I'm gifted and comfortable in ministry, and there are other things I'm not very good at. But there are people in the church who have those other gifts and those other strengths. Doing the Matthew 28, you know, you, you always take chances. Some things work, some things don't. But, you know, without us getting into that, this church was dying. And now it is back to life. And we have a lot of young children that now come. Our youth group is getting large. And, you know, it, it's... If you don't take that plunge, you're not going to get any better, you're not going to grow, and, and the church is going to die. Um, I would feel sad if a church wanted to grow and wouldn't embrace this opportunity. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity, you know, uh, and I think for us it was the perfect storm in a positive sense that as a leadership team we recognized we were not where we should be. We wanted to be doing more, but we didn't know how. What I would say is you can do something, and you can start just by praying and asking God, Lord, what is it that we can do? And then look around your neighborhood, because there's always a niche. There's always somewhere that perhaps you could go out and, and serve. You could take cookies to teachers and just love on the teachers twice a year and say thank you to firefighters and to policemen. Just go into trailer parks and maybe show a movie. You could just do the smallest, smallest thing, but when it's done because God has called you to do it, the harvest is gonna be incredible. So I think I would challenge churches, never give up. Even if you're 20 to come to worship, there's some way that God wants you to touch lives. That last little bit uh, that showed our uh, URL for our website is, is a place where you can come back to several times, uh, growingeffectivechurches.org. Uh, there are comments from other churches that have been involved in Matthew 28 and uh, comments about uh, new things that are coming. So all of that is, is part of, of what you as lay people uh, are, are involved in and should be involved in because the pastors can only do a little bit. We are the hands and feet of, of God here. And so there is no way that the Methodist Church is going to grow and be successful uh, without you. And that doesn't mean somebody else uh, it will take care of it. It's you who needs to take care of it and other people will follow you. That's, that's really the key. Uh, in addition to doing the Matthew 28 uh, programs, which are for mid-sized churches, uh, a Growing Effective Churches uh, has the Large Church Initiative, and uh, shortly we'll be, we hope to uh, be offering a pilot program for in the Small Church Initiative. Uh, and that actually is where lay people are more involved than, than in large churches, where they have a, a, a bigger staff. Um, one of the other things, there's two other areas that um, a Growing Effective Churches works in, and that's uh, leading in the establishment of new churches or faith communities that are aligned to making disciples. And also in the development to raise up leadership, both clergy and more importantly, lay, uh, to transform churches. There will be more about this from Dennis Otto, who uh, is in charge of all of this uh, during the reports tomorrow afternoon, uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, there was some mention of equipping uh, 
God's people. Uh, there is a pilot program that is going to be starting shortly uh, up in Avis and Wellsboro in the Williamsport district. And they hope to, uh, within the year, have uh, one down here in the uh, Harrisburg district. So that's the key. And someone just sent me uh, the, 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 the various sessions and what will be going on in there. And uh, there's eight sessions in the program. Um, and uh, they are orientation and how our world has changed is the first session. Uh, the real leaders at, at the mission field, and that's going to be based on the book of uh, Renovate or Die, and uh, uh, Streamlining Your Church, uh, based on the book uh, The Simple Church, uh, Spiritual Gifts, uh, The Healthy Church, based on The Healthy Small Church, and Focusing Outward, the etern excuse me, Externally Focused Church. Uh, that's another book. Uh, so if you want to get a head start in, in learning those things, uh, that would be great. All of that is, is the key to knowing that you are the key to the United Methodist Church uh, being able to grow and thrive and more and more disciples be out there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Charlie. As you can see, we're really hitting home on this Alive in Christ Together and how important the laity is through this process. We've talked about how equipping laity through lay servant ministries and lay speaking ministries and the, and the coursework that's involved with that in terms of also equipping God's people. We talked about how working through uh, growing effective churches and, and how to be alive in that manner. But there's a piece also that is important in terms of being alive in Christ. And that is looking at the call that some of us get in terms of pastoral ministry. Here to talk about that is Carol Diffenbaugh, who's gonna be uh, speaking to us about God's call and what that means in terms of pastoral ministry and, and how that is important for you folks. Good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I am a lay member of the Board of Ordained Ministry of our conference, and I serve specifically uh, as a co-chair of one of its committees. It's called the Interpretation, um, Enlistment and Interpretation Committee, uh, which we commonly refer to as ENI. The ministry of this committee is to help individuals recognize, honor, God's call upon them, and specifically those individuals who feel a calling to the ordained and certified ministries within the United Methodist Church. We talk a lot about God's call, and this is an area that I am so passionate about. Let me share you why. When I look outside these doors, when I look outside the doors of my church, I see a world full of hurting people, a world that's broken. And I think that if you look at the evening news, you read your morning newspaper, I think you tend to agree with me. We're in the midst of a lot of brokenness. But in the midst of that brokenness, in the midst of the struggles that you and I encounter, we have this gift. See, we know Jesus. We know that in Isaiah 43 that God loves us so much. He thinks we're so special. His love is unconditional. We know in Hebrew that um, God will never lead us. God will never forsake us. You and I know this because we have Christ. But there is a world of hurting people out there in a broken wilderness who have yet to know the love of Christ, this wonderful God. This is a gift. This is a gift that we have to share. You know, during Bible times, you look back in the Old Testament, there were plenty of times when God's people were wandering, were in the wilderness, and God called people at that moment 
to help lead those people out of the wilderness. Well, I believe that our church is alive in Christ. I believe God not only calls people in biblical times, God's been busy calling people right here and today and inside our conference. You talk about calls. One of the wonderful things about working on the team that I work with is we get to hear people's call stories. We get to hear things that, oh my goodness, if that was a movie, you wouldn't believe it. This morning, I had two people talk to me. One person saying, Carol, I really believe I'm being called to ministry. I had a young person come up to me and say, I know a 15-year-old. I think this person's being called to some form of ministry. Our God is alive and well in the Susquehanna Conference, calling. It, as we meet in this room, there's another room. I'm not quite sure where it is, John, but I know there's a group of people who are meeting. Ordinary people who led ordinary lives, who one day said, God, if you're calling me, I don't know where, but I'm going with you. Now, some of those people are serving as our pastors. Some of those people are serving in what's called the ordained ministry. Some serving as an elder, maybe leading a local church, maybe in extension ministries, working at Daystar or Mission Central or in prisons. Some of these people can tell you the first moment they heard God's call upon them. And for some of those people, it was during church camp quite a few years ago. Church camp. Now, some of these people in that room are also serving as an ordained person, as an ordained deacon. They're called to the word, service, compassion and justice. They're serving the church as an extension to the world. This broken world we live in, they're kind of helping, merging the two. Some of these people serve as nurses, some of them serve as musicians, some are educators, social workers, some work with the elderly. It's very diverse, they're calling but it's all the same. There are other people who are serving as local pastors, leading churches and growing disciples. And there's still others who are in the candidacy process. These are ordinary people with ordinary lives who said yes to God's call. Wherever you call me, I'll go. Now, some of these people who have said yes to God and God's call are right in front of me. I know some of you, and a lot of you I don't know, but I know of your ministries. A lot of you have said yes to God, to ministries and vocations that may have taken you out of your comfort zone and into places that you think, really? I never would have thought. But let me tell you the rest of the story. Through God's grace, this is what has happened. Some of you are serving as Christian educators, some as musicians, lawyer, bridge builders. Some are you the praying hands of the church, leading Bible studies. Some of you are lay servants and certified lay ministers. You see, God calls us to a variety of ministries and vocations, and whether that calling be ordained, whether that calling be certified, or whether that calling be something else, they're all equal, equally important within this kingdom building. Now, some of you right here might be in the midst of a call, that nudging, that time where, hmm, not quite sure what God's leading me to, not quite sure what it is. It, it's a time that many people look at and say it's a time where it's intentional. It's sort of like Samuel. You know, he didn't get it the first time. He needed Eli to help him, and even the second time he didn't get it. But what it did do 
is it made Samuel more aware of God's voice. That may be the time that you're in right now. Or, or maybe for some of you, you already heard that call. You can articulate other people. Eli's of your church have brought you up and said, I believe you're called to. And many of you may have responded <clears throat> the same way many people in history have responded. Um, oh no, it's got to be the other person you're talking about. It's, it's not me. Or God, wait a minute, you know, I, I don't think the timing's right. I mean, I, I, I'm either too old, I'm too young, I'm not smart enough. Um, gee, I just, um, I don't know, you put in the blanks. Something as a barrier of saying yes to God. And you know what? That's who we are. If you look back in the Bible and you read some of those Bible stories about the people who were called by God, well, first of all, God doesn't wait to call us till we're perfect. If you don't believe that, go read about some of the people God called back then. HR would have a fit. <laughs> but in the midst of all of this, in God's perfect timing, all we're called to do is step out in faith and trust God. Some of you are Eli's of the church. Some of you know people within your church that are being called. Some may be very young. There are studies out there that indicate camping is one of the first places people start hearing the articulation, that nudging of a call. Children, many times, you start seeing those pastoral gifts at such a young age. And the Eli's of the church, it's our responsibility to help these individuals nurture and recognize God's call upon them. Now, you remember in the beginning I said, this is something I'm really passionate about and the people who know me know that I really mean it. But let me tell you why. I told you that when I look out these doors, I see a world of hurting people. People who are lost and looking, not sure what they're looking for, but they know they're in a place they don't want to be. I can remember being one of those people. And because someone said yes to God, because someone stepped forth and said, yes, God, and lived out their calling, and in doing so, they shared the love of Christ with me. When I hear the news at night, when I read the papers of sad stories, I pray that those people know the God that we have, that they're embraced by a loving God who loves them so dearly that even in the midst of the human strife, the human condition, they know they're cared and loved in a way that you and I can't imagine. Is our church alive in Christ? If you ask me, I say absolutely. God is still calling God's people just as he called Mary and Moses and Samuel and Abraham. God is still calling us to step out in faith and say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. The e &I team is here to help you and your church in so many ways to help you recognize and claim your call, to live out your calling. Some of the ways, the God Calling event. This is an event to help individuals better understand God's call and the ministries within our United Methodist Church. The, the event is for anyone, college age or older, anyone that you might know who might be wrestling, for, wrestling with a, a calling, or someone you know that you think, 
I think you're being called to a form of ministry. Now, we've had these events for many years. This thing about calling, the importance of Eli's. I know a young person who came to one of these events. I don't remember if she was high school age. I think she was. She might have been early college. I know she came to one of these, well, that was a previous, but she must have been um, about college age at that time. She came saying, quite upfront, I'm here because someone told me I should be here. I am not called to any form of ministry. That's okay. That's fine. She came the next year. Well, I'm here to listen. Not quite sure I'm changing anything, but I decided to come back. You know, God has this way of talking to people in the midst of life. Well, somewhere in the midst of all of that, God talked to this young woman because she's now about to be ordained as an elder. You wonder if God's alive in our conference? God's alive in so many ways. This event, come. If you know someone who should, help them come. The event's going to be in August and will be held at First United Methodist Church. If you happen to be in the candidacy process, this is a requirement for certification. So come. If you're wondering, should I come? You should come. And when you come together, we'll learn more about God's call. We'll learn more about leadership in the church and about the various ministries within our church, as well as the candidacy process. We will have special emphasis on the ordained ministry, on certified ministries. But let me tell you, lay, I'm a lay person, our calling is the same. There's no hierarchy of calls. But let's just make sure we honor call, going in the right direction that we're called to. If you're 18 to 26 years of age, you may be interested in attending the 2013 Exploration Event, which is hosted by our Greater United Methodist Church. This is event is to help individuals discern a call into the ordained ministries of the United Methodist Church. It's going to be held in Denver this year, in November, and they do have their own blog site, which you can go to, just Google Exploration 2013. You can read about the speakers, the workshops, and all kinds of information. E and I, through the Board of Ordained Ministry, will provide a scholarship for a limited number of individuals attending exploration. We're serious about this stuff. We want to make sure if you're to be there, you're there. The scholarship will be in the form of airfare to and back Denver when you go with our group being led by Pastor Julia Piper. If you're interested in this, if you know someone who might be interested in this, tell them to contact us as soon as possible. Get their name on the list. E&I is here to help you and your church. We do provide other ways in which we want to help. We provide two ministry internships every year to help individuals have the experience of going into a local United Methodist Church within the confines of our conference, having an internship that's 10 to 12 hours a week so they get to experience ministry right up front and close. And for that school year, they will receive a $5,000 scholarship. We also have the Thomas K. Cartwright Scholarship um, in honor of the, of, uh, the deceased uh, Reverend Dr. Thomas Cartwright, who did a lot of work on the culture of the call and leading our team. This scholarship is awarded annually to a certified candidate, 35 or younger, within our conference uh, who's, going on, uh, who's in the candidacy process. Our committee is here to help you with um, culture of the call materials. Remember I talked to you about Eli's and how important that is, about how important camp is to young people because for many of them that's the first time they have a sense of calling. There have been studies done to help us better recognize and help people claim their call. Culture of a call. There are some churches that 
have so many people walking out of their doors going into various forms of ministries. They've been identified throughout conference. And their pattern is because they expect, they expect people in their congregation to receive a call. Let me ask you, look to your right, look to your left, now you might not know all those faces, but let me tell you something. Someone you just saw out there is being called. And some of those faces you saw are being called to the ordained ministry. As lay people, I think we trip over that word. The first thing we do is say no. Let's make sure that when God calls us, we honor whatever call that is, laity or ordained. The culture of the call. We have materials to help you. We have workshops, we have curriculums, we have, we have people who will come and talk to your SPRCs to help them better understand the role they have in identifying, nurturing, and assisting young people being called to ministry. All of this, information about um, colleges, scholarships, all of this is found on our website, on the conference website under the Board of Ordained Ministry. Or, or better yet, stop by our table during annual conference and speak to one of our committee members. God's calling. We're here to help. So as I leave, I ask you, share your call stories with one another. Talk to your pastors. Ask them to share their call stories with you. And then I ask you, what are your plans? And what plans does God have for you? There's a world of hurting and lost people out there walking in the wilderness. How is God calling you to share the gift of Christ with them and help lead them out of this wilderness? I thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. One of the things that I'd, I'd like to share with you, I mean, why this was important at this time, not only because it's a way of being alive in Christ, but calls do happen here at conference. One of the uh, folks that, are, that have retired this year, one of the clergy that have retired this year, is someone who received a call at, an, at this at annual conference. Uh, they had come to this uh, as a lay member, much like many of you out there, and they began to feel the nudging that Carol talked about, that pulling. They talked with their pastor. They ended up going to licensing school, becoming a licensed local pastor, and this year they retired from the clergy. So it happens, and I'm sure many of you have similar stories or know of similar folks that, that have experienced that type of call. And whether it's as a, as a clergy person or you're being called to some sort of lay ministry that, that Kathy had talked about, pray to God, talk with God about that call, talk with others. Because we, as, as Charlie had said, we are the arms and the legs, the hands and the feet of Christ here. Before I get into the next area, which is community building, I want to introduce some members from your community that, that are out there sitting who work with me as, as lay leadership here at the conference. If the associate conference lay leaders and district lay leaders who are here in this session are able to get out of work and they're retired or they've taken vacation time. If you wouldn't mind just standing to be recognized, because I, I know you're out there. Let's give these a round of applause. One of the things that I did last year whenever I knew that my name was put, being put into nomination was I spent a lot of time listening listening to you folks that come to annual conference. And one of the things that I found 
was that, and I took home and I prayed about it, was that there was a sense of isolation that many of you felt. Whether it be yourself here at conference or that your church seems like you're doing it all on your own. Well, I want to dispel that and I want to work on that. And, and I've been led to take a look at some ways that we can do that in terms of community building. So what I'd like you to do in the next 10 minutes, and if you could put this next slide up here that, that deals with it. In the next 10 minutes, I'd like you to kind of break out into some small groups. In the places that you are, you can turn chairs. If you wouldn't mind breaking into groups of four to eight people, I'd like you just to introduce yourself and begin talking with one another in the group. Get to know folks one another, things that you might want to talk about or the church you're from, the area you're from, uh, some interesting things about you, some, whether this is your first conference, your second, your 15th annual conference, whatever. But also, what I'd like you to do is begin to gather some of the concerns that, and joys that folks have and that are holding inside. And what I'd like you to do is take those and begin praying with one another and praying for one another throughout conference to make that commitment that you will be a prayer group within you know the folks within your small group will pray for one another during this time of holy conferencing to lift one another up in prayer okay one of the things if i could have your attention please just for a couple minutes what i'd like you to do is we have an opportunity now that, that you've, got, you've begun to know one another and hopefully have everybody's names. I'd like you to begin talking about some of the vitality that you have in your churches, the things that you recognize as vital, the things that are alive in your church, that the things that are, are bringing folks to God and making disciples. This is a good opportunity to start, to start gathering that. Now, one of the things that I'd like you to do within your groups is if does every group have at least one person that has a blank sheet of paper and either a pencil or a pen and I'll tell you right now there's no presentation on this you just have to be a legible scribe <laughs> you don't have to get up here it's not part of lay speaking <laughs> does, if you don't have a pen a pencil or a blank sheet of paper, just raise your hand. We have some over here that we can hand out, but generally everybody should have a piece of paper and a pencil. And I'd like you to just write down the vitality that you have in your churches right now. If you could, if you could briefly summarize that from your group and also just list the church and the district that you're in. And if you don't know the district, that's okay. Just list the church or the charge that you're in, and we'll find that out. We're going to gather that information later because it's going to help us in planning out throughout the year. So if you could take about five and ten minutes and just talk about that for now. What I'd like you to do now is on your sheet of paper, draw a line across the page. And at the bottom half of the page, I'd like you to begin discussing and thinking about those things or ministries or mission activities that you think are possible within your local church that aren't happening right now. Things that could, with just a little bit of resources, either from members of your congregation or from the district or from the conference, if you had those resources, this is something that could take off. This is, this is something, some sort of vital ministry or mission that could just take off with just a little bit of resourcing. So I'd like you to just shift gears for a little bit and begin thinking about and dreaming about some things that are on the verge of taking off in terms of vitality. Okay. Let's close our prayer and ask for God's grace before lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning that we could share in ways to be alive in Christ together on a journey of faith. We thank you for allowing us this opportunity to make new friends, to share the vitality of our local churches, and discuss the dreams on how that vitality can grow. As Paul prayed for the Ephesians, I pray that we may have power together 
with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Over the next hours, we will be nourishing our bodies with the food that your hand has provided. Thank you for this abundance. Thank you for the hands that prepared it and will serve it. As we enjoy it, may we never take it for granted, and may we not forget those who have but a meager portion of all that we have. May we view this meal as your physical nourishment to us, that we may go forth and nourish those not as fortunate as we are. Lord, we lift up all these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. That's it for Lady Session. Thank you so much. <laughs>